Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and thanks for watching. Well, it's time for our summer update on the status of the Pennsylvania economy. And then we're going to hear from two of Pennsylvania's leading journalists. All of that after these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Hi, welcome back to the program, and again, thanks for watching. Well, the stock market is up and down. We're going to find out how the Pennsylvania economy is doing, and we couldn't have a better guest to do to chat about that with us than Dennis Yablonski. He's the Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development. You know, the titles used to be simpler for that, <laughs> commonly just referred to as DCED, right, yes, Mr. Correct. Secretary? Well, thanks for coming on the show. I remember when it used to be Commerce and Community Affairs. It was a little, you get like tongue-tied saying it yourself it, sometimes. It's, it's, it's a little long, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's necessary. I understand. Well, it's probably a wise move. I think that was a good idea, merging those departments because they are so interrelated. Uh, you know, you, it's absolutely true. I mean, you can't develop the economy if your communities aren't doing well, yeah. and you can't develop communities without jobs, so they really are intertwined. Yeah. And we often talk about how government doesn't coordinate very well. You know, one arm of government doesn't know what the other arm <laughs> is doing, and when that, uh, how long has that been now since this? Since 1996, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I remember the, the, the debate. There wasn't actually much of a debate over it. I think there was a fair consensus about why, why we should do that. At any rate, uh, Mr. Secretary, let's go to the, the topic at hand. The Pennsylvania economy still seems to be doing pretty well. I notice our unemployment figures are below the national average mm -hmm. yet. The job production is reasonably decent. It's not great. Mm -hmm. We're sort of muddling along. But we have a pretty serious problem we haven't been able to overcome. And we've talked about this before. And I think it's, as, a, as a teacher, it's, it's something that really has concerned me over the years. And that is the fact that we've got a lot of young people. They graduate from high school. So many of them go on, not enough, I think, go on to college, and then what do they do in many cases? Yeah, the whole, um, the whole brain drain issue, yeah. as, as, as it's called. It's one of the uh, policy topics that the governor uh, asked us to work on early in his, uh, his first term, and, and uh, we've uh, implemented a number of new programs. But the, the good news is that we have one of the greatest assets that you need to address that problem, that is our world-class college and university right. system. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's number two in students. Uh, we're the, you know, it's interesting, we're the number one importer of freshmen in America, yeah. uh, and number two net importer, including yeah. the people that go out of state. And many of these young people, when they finish their four years or six years or whatever, uh, express an interest in staying. And uh, we've been trying to do things to create an environment that will make it good for them to stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the problem here is the old, I mean, okay, they'll come and they'll go to one of our fine schools. And you're right, there are over 100 private and public universities and colleges, many of them world class. You're absolutely right about that. On the other hand, in many cases, particularly outside of the southeastern part of the United States, of, of our state yeah. rather, there just simply aren't a lot of jobs. Now there's growing jobs, I think, up in the... Uh, up in Monroe and Pike County, a very fast-growing area. The Lehigh Valley is pretty healthy, south-central Pennsylvania. But we still have a very mixed situation mm -hmm. with regard to economic development. What is the strategy, what, is your, what has been your strategy to sort of address that and to keep young people from leaving the state? Well, there's two pieces to it. There's jobs and then there's quality of life. Right. And, and we're uh, in parallel trying to address both. On, on the beyond the broader set of issues that we've talked about on your show many times, uh, the governor had me implement a very specific program called the Keystone Innovation right. Zone program. And it's uh, designed to be a public-private partnership built around our colleges and universities, which exist all over the state, not just in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, uh, with the private sector involved, local government involved, et cetera, where they identify which sectors of the economy can best be grown in their regional area. And then we focus on creating new companies, helping the existing ones, and retaining uh, young people after they graduate. We now have 26 of these KIZs. They're literally all over the state. Uh, they're beginning to see, uh, we're seeing the effects of that, and it's starting to work. So that's on the job side. Okay. On the, uh, on the quality of place side, and there's some good work done by Richard Florida on the rise of the, of the creative right. class. It's an right. interesting set of research. 
But basically, it says that all things being equal, job-wise, young people are going to go where they can find a clean, safe, exciting yeah. place to live, work, and play. Um, and uh, what we're trying to do there is help our core communities, places like York and Lancaster and Washington, Pennsylvania and Allentown, revitalize mm -hmm. their downtown areas uh, commercially, but then also residentially and recreationally, creating interesting, exciting places. And the combination of those two right. will address the problem. So I've talked to the governor about this when he's been on. We're going to run to a break. But I think the, the philosophy behind it is that the public sector works in partnership with the private sector. The public money is used as an incentive more than anything a else. Stimulant, I mean, so a stimulant, so to speak. Okay, or, good, good way to put it. Incentive right. or a stimulus to help promote economic growth. But then... It has to be pretty much up to the private sector to carry the ball. Absolutely. And the bulk of the financing and the bulk of the, of the work is done by the private sector. All right. I'm chatting with Dennis Yablonski. He's the Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development. We're talking about we get kind of a little summer update here on economic development in the state. More on that subject, and we'll talk to our journalists uh, in the second part of the show when we return. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by... The Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Pennsylvania Medical Society, doctors and patients, preserve the relationship. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association, business in Pennsylvania is our business. Hi, welcome back to the program. We're chatting with Dennis Yablonski, Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development. All right, we're going to let you put your pitch in for the governor's fall agenda. Sure. We got it. We got Thank it. You. We're not going to have you on here and not let you do that. <laughs> you know, and some of it's controversial. You know that. Yeah. The governor, you know, he comes on and we chat about it and he understands, you know, that not everybody thinks that, you know, he, he ought, that the state ought to do what he wants him to do, but he's been pretty, pretty lucky. And not lucky, he's been pretty good at getting what he wanted to do <laughs> out of the legislature. Well, what, let's talk about this energy business. I think sure. it's pretty important, and it's going to come back in the fall. What, is, what does the administration want out of the legislature this fall with regard to energy? The priority are two pieces of the governor's proposed energy package. One is the Penn Securities Fuel Initiative, which will establish the standards for ethanol and right. biodiesel. And the other one is the Energy Independence Fund, the $850 million fund that will give us the money that we need to be able to drive these clean and renewable energy projects going forward, as well as support some of the, uh, some of the reduction energy uh, spending that goes on. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about each one of them now. The, the standards for the biofuels, other states have begun to move in that direction. I think California has already right. set standards. I don't know how many states have done that or not. Maybe you do. It's not, not that important. But the bigger question is, that doesn't seem to be, you, know, you tell me if I'm wrong about this, as controversial as the second part coming up with the 800, or, or, or am I wrong about that? I think generally that's correct. Um, we'll talk about the fund in okay. a minute. I think there's, uh, I haven't heard a lot of certainly uh, um, uh, vitriol uh, from yeah. anybody in the General Assembly about it. And we, we feel that the, uh, that the, uh, the fuels part uh, has a pretty good chance of passing. And it's a 10% ethanol standard and a 20% biodiesel standard. Now, does that mean that at the pumps, when people would go in to fill up, you know, to buy gasoline, that those standards would apply to all gasoline? And, uh, and diesel. It, and diesel. Yeah, when, when we Explain have that. the capacity, uh, when we have 200 million gallons of ethanol capacity and the distribution okay. network to get it to the pumps, there will be a requirement that there be 10 percent ethanol and all gas. And when we have 300 million gallons a year of biodiesel capacity and distribution capability, then there will be a requirement for 20 percent biodiesel and diesel fuel. And uh, that will not only help in, in some obvious ways in terms of reducing our dependence on oil, but the jobs and the economic right. impact right. of that is significant. All right, let's talk then about the other piece of that, which and I, I think is a more difficult challenge, uh, and that, is, that has to do with uh, whether the state would be sort of the initiator, you would provide grants and other resources to companies to uh, get involved in energy, environmentally friendly energy technology right. uh, growth applications. Talk, say something about that. Yeah, the, the, the fund really is break, broken into three pieces. There's an early stage piece to try to pull more of the exciting technologies out of our universities, commercialize them, and create the jobs and the technologies right. here. Things that will make solar uh, less expensive, things that will allow us to burn coal clean, those types of things. 
Then there's a project financing piece that will allow the state to come in and stimulate the development of ethanol, biofuel, clean coal, solar, and wind by providing mainly low interest loans and some grant money to, to do that. And then finally, there's the appliance swap, the rebates on right. appliances, and the energy rebate program that will incentivize uh, those, those aspects. Now, the original idea was to uh, attach a fee to the electric <coughs> bill that was, it was at $5? It was, go, go, it go was 45 cents a month, $5.40 right. a year for the average homeowner. It's called a systems benefit charge. And that we would use that to pay for the bonds that you the bond float. issue. And the programs that would be implemented would save people more money than they spent. Um, there's been some notional things coming out of the General Assembly that maybe we ought to try to find an alternative source mm -hmm. to fund this, which the governor is open right. to, and that'll probably be one of the prime discussions. But I will say this, the governor still believes uh, and, uh, that the system's benefit charge is the best way to finance this program. The, e the easiest way without a heavier burden on the taxpayers is at the point. That's point. I mean, you know, it's t t t t and, and by the way, a lot of these programs in the polls that I've seen are popular. It w I, I, I think the <coughs> major problem is just how you pay for them. It's not that I think the citizens of the state don't like some of these ideas. Right. When you get into these taxes, you know, that's what's been... All right, in the minute or so that we have left, I'll let you make a pitch for the uh, the SALK funding. I, we talked about this before. That yeah. seems to be a tougher road to hoe in the last... Yeah, I mean, you guys, why you keep working on we're it? Get, we're you're indefatigable, away. indefatigable we're, on We're that, persistent and we're going to keep at it. I, understand. I mean, it passed the House, which yes. is, so we made some progress in the spring. And so now it's up to the Senate to decide what to do. Now, what is it? Explain it's the what it is. It's a $500 million bioscience research and commercialization initiative that would allow us to uh, continue to uh, move our leadership position forward in the state in developing cures for disease uh, across a range right. of, uh, of areas. Um, and uh, the initially, the Senate said that they would they would run a vote on this in November in the fall. Mm -hmm. Recently, as recently as yesterday, um, there was a comment made that because the Haska bill didn't pass, they weren't going to run yeah. SALK. I don't understand the connection, right. and I'm going to see if I can sort well, it out. Well, you you, we know you're going to continue to push, uh, plug away on that. All right, thanks, Mr. Secretary. All right, we come back from this break. We're going to talk about, uh-oh, what, what is your right to know what about public records in the state of Pennsylvania? It's a hot topic, and we have two of our contributing journalists here to chat about that after these messages. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the state system of higher education. 14 state-owned universities. The state system is the largest provider of higher education in Pennsylvania. And by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania. Working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back to the program. Joining me now, as often is the case, is Brad Bumstead from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review and Robert Swift from the Times Shamrock Newspapers. All right, gentlemen, let me, uh, uh, Robert, let me start with you, and we'll go to Brad then for some specific examples of this. Look, Pennsylvania has an, I mean, you journalists complain all the time, be honest about this, that you ask for information, and, it, and, and often it's refused by state agencies. I know local government, r reporters at the local government level have the same problem. The issue is we have an open records law where the presumption is the records are closed unless you can demonstrate a reason why you should have that information. Robert, what's wrong with that law? It puts the burden of proof on the uh, individual citizen or, or a journalist. And in the case of a citizen, they don't have the resources to sometimes make that burden, uh, to even, uh, you know, even to know what might be available that they could even look at. So it, a citizen should not have to, um, you know, go into a process like that with the odds already stacked against them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's much in this uh, state government and, in, for example, the legislative branch is completely exempt from the law. And in, in the rest of the state government, it's just um, when you have um, not constrictions on the flow of information, ultimately you're leading to a basically less informed public right. electorate. Right. You feel the same way about this? Same view? I do. And some of the bills that are pending right now would flip that presumption. Right. And, and 
uh, presume that records are open uh, subject to various exceptions. Yeah, now, hold on a minute. Now, everybody understands that there are pers certain personnel decisions that should, you know, and I think the governor is entitled to a certain amount of confidentiality in his discussions with his advisors, you know, particularly email. But you folks are talking about a lot of sort of basic information, and you brought up the legislature. Uh, you brought up the legislature, Brad. Uh, shouldn't there... Shouldn't their records be open to the public? I mean, or the caucus accounts, the money that they have, that each of the four uh, caucuses have? Is there a reason that you can think of why you shouldn't be able to get that information? No, no, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to get the information. But we do get some of that information. But it's pretty much what they want to make available to us. And if you disagree with what they've provided or you don't think they've provided enough, you have no recourse. Mm -hmm as you do under the right to know law with executive branch right. you can file an appeal and you can go to court but you can't uh, pursue anything in the legislature because the law doesn't apply to them conveniently yeah see that I mean the exec why I can't figure out a rationale for treating the executive branch differently in terms of legal aspects of this than the legislature can you do what well, lawmakers have the power to make the law and well, I understand the past, they have like the power. so many times they didn't, didn't want to apply to them so what you have now is um, some of the, in, in recent months, some of the has become a little bit more easy in information, mm -hmm. but you still don't have the power of the law behind you when you're dealing with legislative, you know. Yeah, you want to you add something, I think. But you're right. There's no good reason why uh, the law that applies to the executive branch shouldn't apply to the legislature. Yeah, before we go to some specific examples, one, one, one follow-up question. I mean, it seems to me that, that no one should be allowed to go kind of on a fishing expedition and force a branch of government or a department in a branch to spend countless hours and hours putting together information that they might not otherwise have in one form. I mean, there is, there are certain, uh, you know, certain reasons, I think, why some kinds of information that you, you know, in other words, you shouldn't be able to calculate it, get them to calculate it or put it together in a form that you want, but the raw information that they have ought to be made available. Is that is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, and you shouldn't really have to ask them to calculate information because if computerized records were treated as the same as paper records, yeah. they'd be able to give us the database and we could compute it. Yeah, do you agree with so, that? Yeah, and so some of the, I agree with that. Some of the issues are, was coming up in this law, once you make to have a presumption that the records are open, what's going to be very interesting in the legislation is the exceptions. And that's right. what's being argued about. Should 9-11 calls be, be ex accept, an exception? Right. That sort of thing. So, Email. Yeah. Um, that's what we're some of the t uh, tug of wars going on right now in the legislature. All right, Brad, let's give our viewers a couple of examples of specific things that <clears throat> reporters have asked for that they've had trouble getting. Sure. Um, all of us remember the horrific um, uh, bridge collapse in Minnesota and the vivid TV images that we saw as a result of that. Uh, but even after that uh, terrible accident in Mi Minneapolis, PennDOT wouldn't release um, inspection reports of bridges in Pennsylvania, particularly the types of bridges that were similar to the I-38 West in Minneapolis. And it took a uh, Democratic state uh, uh, committee chairman, Babette Josephs, basically uh, holding a hammer over, over the PennDOT secretary's head, a Rendell cabinet agency, um, and, and saying, look, this stuff should be public. And uh, so maybe a couple days after that, right. um, PennDOT did release the uh, bridge inspection reports. But at the same time, while they're saying the bridge inspection reports are now public, you can see these, and they put them on their website, uh, PennDOT won't release what's called crash data. Mm -hmm. And this crash data would show where the most serious accidents occur in Pennsylvania and, and, and the frequency of those accidents. So you could determine, if you wanted, the street that I drive down to work is one of the worst in the state. Yeah. I'm not going to drive on that. I'm going to take a different route. They will not release wow. that data. All right. We're chatting with uh, two of Pennsylvania's leading journalists about uh, the right to know law. How about the governor's election? I thought we just re-elected Governor Rendell, the voters of the state. Already we're talking about governor re possible successors to Governor Rendell. More on that subject when we return. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. 
and by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Builders Association, building today for a better tomorrow, and by the Pennsylvania Cyber Charter School, bringing educational innovation and freedom to the children of Pennsylvania. Hi, welcome back uh, to the Pennsylvania Newsmakers. All right, Robert, let me start with you. I can't believe this. Governor Rendell is six, seven months into his second term, and people are talking about his successor, interviewing potential candidates who are actually assessing their chances to succeed him. Take it from there. I was there. taken aback by it. I mean, it <laughs> happened. We only had the first uh, vote in a presidential straw poll in Iowa just this yeah. past Saturday, but already a long, there was a long interview with uh, Don Cunningham, the um, former um, Riddell cabinet official, a Lehigh County executive, uh, Senator uh, Bob Mello of Scranton, yeah, from the Exploratory Committee, and yeah. been quite uh, upfront about that. So you're uh, you're already into this. Uh, and you're on the Republican side, uh, the names of you know Tom Corbett, the Attorney General, uh, the uh, U.S. Attorney Meehan in Philadelphia, uh, former Lieutenant Governor Bill Scranton yeah. are being tossed about. Unbelievable. And it's, it's, uh, you know. <laughs> And Brad, and Brad, I'm not going to, I got to bring you in on the Western Pennsylvania Democrats. We've got the county executive, Dan Honorado, and we have Jack Wagner, the Auditor General, who, by the way, I guess are not in the same sort of political wing of their own party out there. No, but Mike, no. Go ahead, take it. They're from not. And, and, you know, it's, this, this baffles me, too, the, the degree to which this is already a blood sport at the Capitol that people <laughs> are talking about it. But, uh, uh, people are talking about Dan Honorado as the front runner yeah. at this point. I mean, how are you going to have a front runner? No disrespect intended to Mr. No, Honorado, but, but at this early stage, who knows what's going to happen? Another interesting point on this with the Republicans, um, with two of them, it sort of depends how their, their big investigations turn out. Patrick Meehan, of course, has uh, indicted Senator Vincent Fumo of mm -hmm. Philadelphia. That's supposed to go to trial next year. If he loses that big case... Yeah, who Fumo's knows? acquitted. What are his chances? Tom yeah. Corbett is investigating the bonuses in the state house, and will that turn out to be anything? Yeah. Who knows? Well, thanks. I mean, we're, we're going to get out of here now, but I mean, this is about the earliest. Give me a yes or no. The earliest I've seen any reporting on a governor's election just this soon after we just installed the governor for a second you are, term. You're absolutely right. This, this it is, is the record. earliest. Yeah, I, it's, it's remarkable. All right, thanks for watching Pennsylvania Newsmakers. We'll see you next week, and stay well.